The Junius Pamphlet by Rosa Luxemburg, Chapter Three. Our party should have been prepared to recognize the real aims of this war, to meet it without surprise, to judge it by its deeper relationship according to their wide political experience. The events and forces that led to August Fourth, nineteen fourteen, were no secrets. The world had been preparing for decades, in broad daylight, in the wide- widest. Publi- publicity, step by step, an hour by hour, for the world war. And if today a number of socialists threaten with horrible destruction the secret diplomacy that has brewed this devilry behind the scenes, they are ascribing to these poor wretches a magic power that they little deserve, just as the Borokud whips his fetish for the outbreak of a storm. The so-called captains of nations are, in this war, as at all times, merely chessmen, moved by all-powerful historic events and forces on the surface of capitalist society. If ever there were persons capable of understanding these events and occurrences, it was the members of the German social democracy. Two lines of development in recent history lead straight to the present war. One has its origin in the period when the so-called national states i.e. the modern states, were first constituted from the time of the Bismarckian War against France. The War of 1870, which by the annexation of Alsace-Lorraine threw the French Republic into the arms of Russia, split Europe into two opposing camps and opened up a period of insane competitive armament, first piled up the firebrands for the present world conflagration. Bismarck's troops were still stationed in France when Marx wrote to the Braunschweiger Ausschuss. He was not deafened by the momentary clamor and is not interested in deafening the German people, must see that the War of 1870 carries with it, of necessity, a war between Germany and Russia, just as the War of 1866 bore the War of 1870. I save necessity, unless the unlikely should happen, unless a revolution breaks out in Russia before that time. If this does not occur, a war between Germany and Russia may now be regarded as un fait accompli. It depends entirely upon the attitude of the German victor to determine whether this war has been useful or dangerous. If they take Alsace-Lorraine, then France with Russia will arm against Germany. It is superfluous to point out the disastrous consequences. At that time, this prophecy was laughed down. The bonds which united Russia and Prussia seemed so strong that it was considered madness to believe in a union of of autocratic Russia with Republican France. Those who supported this conception were laughed at as madmen, and yet everything that Marx had prophesied has happened to the last letter. For that is, says Auer in his sudden sedan fire, social democratic politics, seeing things clearly as they are, and differing therein from the day-by-day politics of the others, bowing blindly down before every momentary success. This must not be misunderstood to mean that the desire for revenge for the robbery accomplished by Bismarck has driven the French into a war with Germany, that the kernel of the present war is to be found in the much-discussed Revenge for Alsace-Lorraine. This is the convenient nationalist legend of the German war agitator, who creates fables of a darkly brooding France that cannot forget its defeat, just as the Bismarckian press servants ranted of the dethroned Princess Austria, who could not forget her erstwhile superiority over the charming Cinderella Prussia. As a matter of fact, revenge for Alsace-Lorraine has become the the theatrical property of a couple of patriotic clowns, the Lion de Beltfort, nothing more than an ancient survival. The annexation of Alsace-Lorraine long ago ceased to play a role in French politics, being superseded by new, more pressing cares, and neither the government nor any serious party in France thought of a war with Germany because of these territories. If, nevertheless, the Bismarck heritage has become the firebrand that started this world conflagration, it is rather in the sense of having driven Germany on the one hand and France with it, with it all, and with it all of Europe on the other, 
along the downward path of military competition, of having brought about the Franco-Russian alliance, of having united Austria with Germany as an inevitable consequence. This gave to Russian Tsarism a tremendous prestige as a factor in European politics. Germany and France have systematically fawned before Russia for her favor. At that time, the links were forged that united Germany with Austria-Hungary, whose strength, as the words quoted from the White Book show, lie in the brotherhood in arms in the present war. Thus, the War of 1870 brought in its wake the outward political grouping of Europe about the axis of the Franco-German antagonism and established the rule of militarism in the lives of the European peoples. Historical development has given to this ride and to this grouping an entirely new content. The second line that leads to the present world war, and which again brilliantly justifies Marx's prophecy, has its origin in international occurrences that Marx did not live to see in the imperialist development of the last 25 years. The growth of capitalism spreading out rapidly over a reconstituted Europe after the war period of the 60s and 70s particularly after the long period of depression that followed the inflation and the panic of the year 1873, reaching an unnatural zenith in the prosperity of the 90s, opened up a new period of storm and danger among the nations of Europe. They were competing in their expansion toward the non-capitalist countries and zones of the world. As early as the 80s, a strong tendency towards colonial expansion became apparent. England secured control of Egypt and created for itself in South Africa a powerful colonial empire. France took possession of Tunis in North Africa and Tonkin in East Asia. Italy gained a foothold in Abyssinia. Russia accomplished its conquest in Central Asia and pushed forward into Manchuria. Germany won its first colonies in Africa and in the South Sea and the United States joined the circle when it procured the Philippines with interests in Eastern Asia. Ibis' period of feverish conquests has brought on, beginning with the Chinese-Japanese War in 1895, a practically uninterrupted chain of bloody wars, reaching its height in the Great Chinese Invasion and closing with the Russo-Japanese War of 1904. All these occurrences coming blow upon blow created new extra European antagonisms on all sides between Italy and France in North Africa, between France and England in Egypt, between England and Russia in Central Asia, between Russia and Japan in Eastern Asia, between Japan and England and China, between the United States and Japan in the Pacific Ocean, a very restless ocean full of sharp conflicts and temporary alliances of tension and relaxation threatening every few years to break out into a war between European powers. It was clear to everybody, therefore, one, that the secret underhand war of each capitalist nation against every other on the backs of Asiatic and African peoples must sooner or later lead to a general reckoning that the wind that was sown in Africa and Asia would return to Europe as a ter- as a terrific storm. The more certainty since increased armament of the European states was the constant associate of these Asiatic and African occurrences. Two, that the European World War would have to come to an outbreak as soon as the partial and changing conflicts between the imperialist states found a centralized axis, a conflict of sufficient magnitude to group them, for the time being, into large opposing factions. This situation was created by the, by the appearance of German imperialism. In Germany, one may study the development of imperialism, crowded as it was into the shortest possible space of time in concrete form. The unprecedented rapidity of German industrial and commercial development since the foundation of the empire brought out during the 80s two characteristically peculiar forms of capitalist accumulation the most pronounced growth of monopoly in Europe and the best developed and most concentrated banking system in the whole world. The monopolies have organized the steel and iron industry, i.e. the branch of capitalist endeavor most interested in government orders, in militaristic equipment and in imperialistic undertakings, railroad building, the exploitation of mines, etc., 
and to the most influential factor in the nation. The latter has cemented the money interests into a firmly organized whole with the greatest, most virile energy, creating a power that ought autocratically rules the industry, commerce, and credit of the nation, dominant in private as well as public affairs, boundless in its powers of expansion. Every hungry for pro ever hungry for profit and activity, impersonal and therefore liberal-minded, reckless and unscrupulous, international by its very nature, ordained by its capacities to use the world as its stage. Germany is under a personal regime, with strong initiative and spasmodic activity, with the weakest kind of parliamentari parliamentarism, incapable of opposition, uniting all capitalist strata in the sharpest opposition to the working class. It is obvious that this live, unhampered imperialism coming upon the world stage at a time when the world was practically divided up with, gigan with gigantic appetites soon became an irresponsible factor of general unrest. This was already foreshadowed by the radical upheaval that took place in the military policies of the empire at the end of the 90s. At that time, two naval budgets were introduced which doubled the naval power of Germany and provided for a naval program covering almost two decades. This meant a sweeping change in the financial and trade policy of the nation. In the first place, it involved a striking change in the foreign policy of the empire. The policy of Bismarck was founded upon the principle that the empire is and must remain a land power, that the German fleet, at best, is but a very dispensable requisite for coastal, def coastal defense. Even the Secretary of State, Holman, declared in March 1897 in the Budget Commission of the Reichstag, we need, we need no navy for coastal defense. Our coasts protect themselves. With the two naval bills, an entirely new program was promulgated. On land and sea, Germany first. Germany first. This marks the change from Bismarckian continental policies to Welt politik, from the defensive to the offensive, as the end and aim of Germany's military program. The language of these facts was so unmistakable that the Reichstag itself furnished the necessary commentary. Leiber, the leader of center, the leader of the center at the at that time, spoke on the 11th of March 1896 after a famous speech of the Emperor on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of the founding of the German Empire, which had developed the new program as a forerunner to the naval bills, in which he mentioned shoreless naval planer against which Germany must be prepared to enter into active opposition. Another center leader, Schadler, cried out in the Reichstag on March 23rd, 1898, when the first naval bill was under discussion. The nation believes that we cannot be first on land and first on sea. You answer, gentlemen, that is not what we want. Nevertheless, gentlemen, you are at the beginning of such a conception, at a very strong beginning. When the second bill came, the same Schadler declared in the Reichstag on the 5th of February 1900, referring to previous promises that, were, that, would, that there would be no further naval bills, and today comes this bill, which means nothing more and nothing less than the inauguration of a world fleet as a basis of support for world policies by doubling our navy and binding the next two decades by our demands. As a matter of fact, the government openly defended the political program of its new course of action. On December 11th, 1899, von Bulau, at that time State Secretary of the Foreign Office, in a defense of the second naval bill, stated, when the English speak of a Greater Britain, when the French talk of the New France, when the Russians open up Asia for themselves, we too have a right to aspire to a Greater Germany. If we do not create a navy sufficient to protect our trade, our natives in foreign lands, our missions and the safety of our shores, we are threatening the most vital interests of our nation. In the coming century, the German people will be either the hammer or the anvil. Strip this of its coastal defense ornamentation, and there remains the colossal program, Greater Germany as the hammer upon other nations. It is not difficult to determine the direction toward which these provocations, in the main, were directed. Germany was to become the rival of the world's great naval force, England. And England did not fail to understand. The Naval Reform Bill and the speeches that ushered them in created a lively unrest in England, 
an unrest that has never again subsided. In March 1910, Lord Robert Cecil said in the House of Commons during a naval debate, I challenge any man to give me a plausible reason for the tremendous navy that Germany is building up, other than to take up the fight against England. The fight for supremacy on the ocean that lasted for one and a half decades on both sides and culminated in the feverish building of dreadnoughts and super dreadnoughts was, in effect, the war between Germany and England. The Naval Bill of December 11, 1899 was a declaration of war by Germany, which England answered on August 4, 1914. It should be noted that this fight for naval supremacy had nothing in common with the economic rivalry, rivalry for the world market. The English monopoly of the world market, which ostensibly hampered German industrial development, so much discussed at the present time, really belongs to the sphere of those war legends of which the evergreen French revenge is the most useful. This monopoly had become an old-time fairy tale, to the lasting regret of the English capitalists. The industrial development of France, Belgium, Italy, Russia, India, and Japan, and above all, of Germany and America, had put an end to this monopoly of the first half of the 19th century. Side by side with England, one nation after another stepped into the world market. Capitalism developed automatically and with gigantic strides into world economy. English supremacy on the sea, which has robbed so many social democrats of their peaceful sleep, and which, it seems to these gentlemen, must be destroyed to preserve international socialism, had, up to this time, disturbed German capitalism so little that the latter was able to grow up into a lusty youth with bursting cheeks under its yoke. Yes, England itself and its colonies were the cornerstones for German industrial growth, and similarly, Germany became, for the English nation, its most important and most necessary customer. Far from standing in each other's way, British and German capitalist development were, were, were mutually highly interdependent and united by a far-reaching system of division of labor, strongly augmented by England's free trade policy. German trade and its interests in the world market, therefore, had nothing whatever to do with a change of front in German politics and with the building of its fleet. Nor did German colonial possessions at that time come into conflict with the English control of the seas. German colonies were not in need of protection by a first-class sea power. No one, certainly not England, envied Germany her possessions. That they were taken during the war by England and Japan, that the booty had changed owners, is but a generally accepted war measure, just as German imperialist appetites clamor for Belgium, a desire that no man outside of an insane asylum would have dared to express in time of peace. Southeast and Southwest Africa, Wilhelmsland or Tsingtao, would never have caused any war, by land or by sea, between Germany and England. In fact, just before the war broke out, a treaty regulating a peaceable division of the Portuguese colonies in Africa between these two nations had been practically completed. When Germany unfolded its banner of naval power and world policies and announced the desire for new and far-reaching conquest in the world by German imperialism, by means of a first-class aggressive navy and by military forces that increased in a parallel ratio, the apparatus for a future policy was established, opening wide the doors for unprecedented possibilities. Naval building and military armaments became the glorious business of German industry, opening up a boundless prospect for further operations by trust and bank capital in the whole wide world. Thus, the acquiescence of all capitalist parties and their rallying under the flag of imperialism was assured. The center followed the example of the national liberals, the staunchest defenders of the steel and iron industry, and by adopting the naval bill it had loudly denounced in 1900, became the party of the government. The progressives trotted after the center when the successor to the naval bill, the high tariff party, came up. While the junkers, the staunchest opponents of the horde navy and of the can canal, brought up the rear as the most enthusiastic porkers and parasites of the very policy of sea militarism and colonial robbery they had so vehemently opposed. The Reichstag election of 1907, the so-called Hottentot elections, found the whole of Germany in a paroxysm of imperialistic enthusiasm, firmly united under one flag, 
that of the Germany of von Bülow, the Germany that felt itself ordained to play the role of the hammer in the world. These elections, with their spiritual pogrom atmosphere, were a, a prelude to the Germany of August 4th, a challenge not only to the German working class, but to other capitalist nations as well, a challenge directed to no one in partic particular, a mailed fist shaken in the face of the entire world.